here is the scoop, everybody who's watching this. One, I wanted to share uh, some insight with anybody and everybody who might have challenges out there. And here's my thinking as to why that might be. One is uh, I'm hearing a lot of stress and strain out of clinical clinicians, owners, and it concerns me. Uh, I'm seeing some posts on some of the Facebook groups that almost look uh, suicidal in nature, which really concerns me. And so I want to, to bring some hope. I want to bring some strategy. I want to bring some planning to that. So we've assembled a panel of people from all over the country here. Uh, I think we have every single time zone represented. We've got north, south, east, west, a little bit of everything. I'm sure there's some geography missing for anyone who wants to poke a hole in that statement. But I want to bring everybody together in the sense of we can talk about what is working for us, where the challenges might lie. I do want to put a few disclaimers out. First and foremost, when we're offering advice, um, you know, the advice I offer tends to be an amalgamation of a whole lot of different resources. And so I'm not trying to uh, claim that any of this content is my brilliant idea or that uh, I'm the originator of it. It's an amalgamation of me reading a lot of books and taking a lot of training. And so this is my uh, upfront disclaimer of uh, I'm using other people's content and so I'm not stealing it and claiming it to be mine. Um, cause I don't want that to be the case at all. So that's sort of the intent is mental health first and foremost, and then, uh, mental health, uh, check in mental health strategy. And then lastly is what strategy can we use when, uh, for our businesses, what can we start putting in plan in place right here, right now? So in two weeks or three weeks or whenever the time might be, we all can come out of this thing hopefully better off than uh, we thought we would come out of this. But more importantly, we're all healthy, happy, and, and still alive, quite frankly. Um, so I, I want to really kick off on the mental health side of things. And with that, I'm going to ask Barb, who is uh, my vice president and the smartest person in the room. Well, golly, I don't even know how to make that statement with everybody here. Um, second smartest person in the room. I don't know who's the first. It's not me, though. Uh, Barb, any thoughts you want to add here while we uh, get rolling? Um, Dr. Anderson's call this morning, my word's not his. He was concerned slash fearful if he doesn't provide some kind of access, verbal access to care, physical access, he will lose business. And that translated to, well, let's come up with a plan because it was a three-way call with his team leader. And we decided to not only remote in, she's going to remote in, she is going to take all the incoming calls. We assessed with her what a real emergency is, and that is, did the pain keep you up last night? That's going to be her very first question if someone says, I have an emergency, which will translate to her to a next series of questions that we went over. And not to bore you with all the details, but this is their plan. Because she's got to be able to assess the incoming calls to call him so he can get an antibiotic to him or if he needs to see them. But we didn't stop there. Here's the value add. We went two steps farther. When you, when you prescribe an antibiotic, we need 48 hours for a change to feel better. So in 48 hours, his team leader, Sonia, is going to reach back out to that person and again next week and again every week until they open. This is a mechanism to add value so that patient will say, wow, during this whole virus mess, they kept in touch with me. I'm not going anywhere else. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> are, are you done with that subject now? Or Okay. I had one more thing that I've been thinking about quite a bit and trying to come up with what would be the best solution to take you know, to fix this in the future, but it's quite possible that the next, um, you know, month to two months, we won't be able to see hygiene patients. And what I really worry about, and I've actually already emailed like the state board and South Dakota Dental Association or South Dakota Delta Dental and all that stuff. Um, what I worry about is <clears throat> for potentially for years, we could see uh, every six month lag in our hygiene schedule as well as our production um, moving forward. I mean, that's something as a business owner you'd never do is shut your hygiene department down for two months. And what I've 
kind of been requesting for them is to try to give us the ability to maybe charge out three hygienes in a year um, or, you know, to be able to fill in this potential two-month void that we might have when we, when we go back. Um, because I don't want to... I don't want to see a slump in my business for two months every six months for the rest of my, you know, for for years potentially. And I want to see that go away. So I'm trying to figure out ways to mitigate that as much as I can too. Um, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. Mark? No, I'm, I'm just, did you get information that that might happen? And Not if it even, happens to you, is it going to happen to all dentists? Well, I, I, you know, based on the CDC recommendation, if you're doing hygiene right now, you're an idiot. So I, I think, yeah, I think it's going to happen to everybody. We're going to have a, a two-month lag. So it's, what do we do? Do we, do we tell those people, sorry, you need to wait four more months before we see you again? Or do we see them right, right away and then see them four months later and keep things going as usual? How do we get rid of that, of that uh, just basically shut down, you know, because it's going to take a long time for that to average out. I mean, I don't know if you any practice owners have had like a, a maternity leave or something like that. It, it hurts for years afterwards. It's not, it's not just something that's easy to just get to go away and, this is just this is more than just one employee. This is the entire practice. Um, so I'm kind of looking at you know what is March, April now. So we're going to be looking at September, October. We're going to have some problems again as far as a production standpoint goes. Um, you know, you, you could potentially cut cut the office production in half in six months, even if we do get back, open back up in April, May. So that's that's kind of what I'm worried about. A couple of thoughts for you, Dr. Carl, and anybody else, please chime in. My suggestion would be, as soon as you can, when you're back and running, meet with your team. And between now and then, meet with your team virtually, like we are right now. Set up a Google chat. If any of you don't know how to do that, we would be glad to do that with you and for you. And meet with your team once a week. I know that they're unemployed, but I think that they'll probably meet with you. It doesn't have to be this is about work. If this is an extended period, this week can be, hey, how are you guys doing? I just had a meeting with all these dentists, and this is what I got out of the meeting. What are you doing at home to keep busy? Who's bored? Who's active? A piece of communication for your team. And as we get closer to, I don't know how to say it, the lift of this virus so we can get back, meet with your team and share with them exactly your feelings because they might have a piece of information or some feedback that we haven't thought of. And a lot of times when you ask your team for feedback, they become empowered, especially if you use their feedback. Piggybacking on that, I think we all are surrounded by really, really smart, smart people in our offices. And sometimes we don't always utilize all the intelligence that we have around us to brainstorm. And we put too much pressure upon ourselves as le leaders and business owners to solve every single problem. And I understand the stress and strain of that, but I think if we utilize our team around us, the resources around us, the people around us, whether it's just our employees, our peer groups, our friends, we'll find one brilliant ideas. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring everybody together here, because <clears throat> just me having a conversation with one person, that's one set of eyes. Somebody else jumping in here, like a Jeff Harrison who's got commenting to me via text right now about this, is going to bring so much clarity that can help all of us. And half of what I'm hearing, Dr. Carl, from you, and, and understandably and rightfully so, is fear. Fear drives us, and the way neurology works, and most of our clients know this content, but I'm going to repeat it for all those on Facebook who don't. The way the brain and neurology works, when you get scared, all the blood flow shifts from the frontal lobe of your brain back to a very primitive part of the brain called the amygdala. And it's the amygdala is responsible for the fight or flight response. It is, it's in t designed to help you run away from a saber-toothed tiger. Now, the problem is... We view the coronavirus the same way primitive humans viewed the saber-toothed tiger. And as a result, 
we get shifted to the fight or flight response and we lose our ability to do great problem solving. So one of the best things that we can do to combat this is how can we shift that blood flow back, back to the frontal lobe so we are able to solve our own problems and if we can't, how can we use the resources around us to help us come up with better solutions than perhaps we're able to right now because of our triggered state. A counselor would call this a triggered state. And it makes it really hard to get your, to solve your way out of a brown paper bag. And I'm picking on nobody by saying that because, you know, I, I look back at my history and I spent years probably in a triggered state. In fact, my wife and I were just laughing the other night because she's like, hey, you can relate. And I said, yeah, 21 years I was in a triggered state. And she said, whoa, hold on. I get the first 15 maybe, but how about the last seven or six? Where would those come from? So the question becomes, what can we do? physically, focus-wise, how can we shift ourselves out? So one of the things I would suggest to you, Dr. Carl, is how can you, when you're thinking about this problem, shelve it, go for a walk, go take some technique, exercise, something that shifts blood flow, shifts your focus to where it allows you to problem solve. Does that make sense, Dr. Carl? Yeah, and then I guess that's what I'm doing right now. I'm talking to my consultants and potentially other doctors. Um, I've emailed the state board. I've emailed Delta Dental of South Dakota. I've de emailed the South Dakota Dental Association. And basically what I'm trying to propose in my state right now is I think they should let us charge out three pro fees in a year this year. Just so we can, just so we have an opportunity to get our, to get our schedule back to where it was before. That's, that's what I'm, well, some and, other type of solution. And let's discuss yeah. that because, you know, you bring up a really valid point that I see latency being an issue six months from now. I don't It'll see it carrying. Six months. What's that? It'll be too late in six months. Well, for sure. But I don't see how, how if you plan ahead, how you'll have latency for six months. I said I see latency in six months because we didn't have hygiene going on right now. I don't see it being a six-month hangover, but I see there being a bubble that we'll have to address in six months. Does that make sense? Kind of, but, you know, if the state's not going to do something like that, it might be smart to take all of our patients from March 15th to April 15th and push them out, you know, however many months so we don't, so we don't have a big gap there. Uh, you, that's, I mean, that's literally what we're looking at. I, that's the thing is, what's the plan? Do we take... You know, some of the patients and move them forward. I, you know, I, that's what I, it, it's, it's a problem that's going to, it's going to hurt. I mean, it's, you know, you're talking fifty, sixty thousand $60,000 a month in revenue gone. And then, you know, the next six months left, it's, it's pretty likely that that's going to happen again. And it's going to, and when you don't have hygiene patients, I'm not scheduling work. I'm not as busy. It's, it's going to be, you know, like this happened now, but we can expect it for a quarter every year if this goes on for, you know, two months. I don't think so with good planning. I want to ask uh, Chuck Miller this to jump. What I'm trying to plan. What, what do we do? So I, I want to have Chuck Miller jump in with us because he and I had a conversation this morning and I really, really liked his plan relative to this. Chuck, if you could uh, unmute yourself and jump in, I think this would be a perfect time for you to share your thoughts. Everybody here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, a couple thoughts to that. One, my hygiene department doesn't run at 100% capacity the way it is right now. So, um, I was planning some hygiene overhauls to begin with. And to be honest, this is kind of a, a good opportunity to hit the reset button with all of that. Um, so, you know, Let's say we're able to open April 6th, which is what the ADA is saying right now. My guess is it'll probably go a little bit longer, but we're going to have probably about three weeks down. Um, so back to Dr. Carl's point, yeah, there could be a gap, but I know that moving forward, based on what we've been doing for the last six months, we're definitely going to have time to fill in those holes with the patients that you know got skipped this time. So I'm not too concerned about um, my plan moving forward is to really hit the ground running. So um, this isn't a plug for dental intel. I don't know how many of you use it, how many of you have heard about it, but basically it's artificial intelligence software that kind of um, uh, 
it works on the back end of your practice management software. In our case, it's EagleSoft. And one of the things that's really nice about um, Dental Intel is the ability to filter and find patients to fit your schedule. Um, so you, you can scroll through whatever categories you want, you know, whether it's just a single procedure or what type of insurance, or you can, and you can compound filter upon filter upon filter. And I'm not trying to make a sales pitch for Dental Intel, but one thing that they have done in the midst of all this is they've come out with specific, they're calling them COVID-19 filters. And I think there's about 14 filters that when you, you sort through that, it'll create a hygiene list for you that right now it'll give you your best hygiene appointments uh, moving forward back when you open. My goal for when we reopen is to knock it out of the park. Um, I'm not going to be content with simply meeting the goals that we had before this. The net, so for the next two to three months, I really want to kill it. And whatever was, you know, in, in restorative or hygiene um, before this, it, it needs to be two, three thousand dollars more a day. Um, so that's where, we're, where I'm really going to start pulling hygiene appointments from. It's going to be a tricky balance because there are going to be people on the schedule that we're there, but a lot of it comes down to prioritizing needs of the patients. And, you know, we just had a, a voicemail from a patient today. I walked up to the front office, patient and left a voicemail. And I think we were calling to maybe confirm an appointment or move an appointment. I didn't get why we were calling him, but the message was basically, hey, I'm calling about my appointment. I understand what's going on right now. I'm very flexible. If you guys need to move me, that's fine. Just call and let me know. Um, so that was an indicator to me that, look, we can build a schedule that's going to work for us, but more important, well, for the patients, but also for us, because that's really important moving forward. I think there needs to be a degree of flexibility from the provider as well as um, flexibility on the part of the patient so that we can meet all of our needs. Because ultimately, if we're not meeting the financial needs of the practice, there's not going to be a place for the patient to go. So. Um, Darren, any questions about that? I tend to talk in circles sometimes after a while. I'd like to jump on it if I can, Darren. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. please. Um, you know, I, I, I love the idea of hitting the reset button. And my hope would be this. You know, if us as the leaders and owners of the business present to our team with fear and doubt, our team will be fearful and doubtful. If we present with confidence, not confidence, but if we present with confidence, they will reply with a better response than fear and doubt. So it's not that you can't show your fear and doubt. You can certainly tell them. But if you if you practice and rehearse, maybe even write it down for some of you, what is your plan when you open up? Is my plan going to be confident? And what does that confident plan look like? And if you're having trouble with those words, call your coach. That's what we do. We help you with that plan. Does your plan sound like fear? If you write your plan, read it to someone in your home, your spouse. Ask them what, what it sounds like. Does it sound like confidence? Because I think we all have an opportunity to reset our buttons, all of our buttons. It's going to be a new day. So I love that, Dr. Miller. Uh, a couple of piggyback thoughts. One would be uh, one of the things uh, Dr. Miller and I discussed this morning was we, we've all heard of block scheduling. We've all designed our ideal day. We should redesign our ideal day as for the next two, three months. How do we want to function in our practice from a revenue schedule management flow perspective for the weeks and months following us coming back? So as an example, maybe we, uh, we want to bring all of our SRPs in, in hygiene first. So from a revenue perspective, we're getting that going and, and serving the patients who have a great need, whereas somebody who is a healthy mouth trophy, putting them off uh, 12, you know, a week or two is not going to kill them, likely. And to Dr. Uh, Anderson's thought earlier of, hey, how do I recover from this? You know, the average patient, the stats say that the average patient sees their hygienist once every 11.2 months. So there's already this huge latency in dentistry that I think for that reason, we don't need to be able to see a patient three times in a year, although it would be nice. And if they agreed to it, that'd be amazing. But I don't know that, that there's, there's a more than enough demand out there. Demand's maybe the wrong word. Supply, I guess, would be better. There's more than enough supply out there of patients who need hygiene to be done that we can fill a schedule. Because the average patient's being seen, you know, 11 point, every 11.2 times uh, or months per year. 
So I don't think there's a shortage there, but there is definitely a capacity, a change in capacity. And I think what it's going to do is create a whole big bottleneck of, of demand such that to Dr. Miller's point, you know, your first month, if you're not doing twice as much dentistry as is normal, you're you're missing the boat and you might have a financial hit that could be quite painful for a long time. Whereas if we come back with good planning to where our goals are much bigger than normal because there's demand there and there's strategy behind it to make sure that from a financial perspective, to Dr. Miller's point, that the business survives so we can serve people, it would be very advantageous to design your ideal day coming back. And your ideal day is going to be exhausting. It's going to be busy as can be. But financially, it should be way more fruitful than what you did prior to all of this taking place. Does that make sense? And and quick side note thought, for everybody who's joining us on Facebook, first off, if you're finding this to be helpful, please do me a favor, hit the share button down here and share it to whatever groups you're in so other people can see this message. The intent of this broadcast here, if you joined us late, was first and foremost to help all of our providers and our employees and dental offices from a mental health perspective. My concern is that there's going to be a lot of mental health challenges coming out of this. I have seen some people posting things on Facebook that look like cries for help from a suicide perspective, and that scares the dickens out of me. So first and foremost is mental health. Secondly is what strategies can we use from a mental health perspective for ourselves and for our team and for our families and our patients at large, quite frankly. And then lastly is what are the business strategies that we can hit? And, you know, it's, it's interesting how it started off with fear being the, the big concern, and rightfully so, because fear is a, is a, is a big problem, and, but how we respond to the fear is the biggest issue. I was chatting with a doctor this morning when I was assembling this, this group that, uh, to join us here who is pretty politically involved in dentistry and the ADA and, and the local state associations. And, and her question or her comment to me, which was pretty profound, was she said, Darren, first off, you can share my story, so I'm not sharing something I don't have permission to. But she said, Darren, I'm a pretty strong person, and I'm a pretty strong person that with all of this going on, she goes, I had five minutes of my, th my brain went dark on me last night. Dark enough, she goes, I started thinking to myself, man, would my kids be better off without me? Not like I'm going to go commit suicide, but what if I went and got COVID and I did die and my life insurance kicked in? And she's like, Darren, I'm not a person who thinks like this at all. So if I'm thinking this and I'm a person who doesn't struggle with depression or anxiety, I can only imagine what others are feeling right now. And I, I think it's a super valid point and one of the biggest reasons why I wanted to bring a, an assembly of people together to, to brainstorm how to help, how all of us can survive or even come out better on the other side. And, and so, Carl, when I think of you, what I'm hearing from you, first and foremost, is a lot, a lot of fear. And it's valid fears, right? Anytime we're scared of something, and, and the example I used with Dr. Stephanie this morning was, you know, it's funny, it's, it's like the monster in the closet, but the monster in the closet turns out to be a pile of dirty clothes sitting on the closet floor that when we shine the light on it, all of a sudden it's not as scary. And so what I want us to focus on here is how can we first break the fears down so they're not as scary, so we have the ability to solve them. And I'm not trying to invalidate anybody's fears because everybody's fears are totally legit. I just want to help people have tools to navigate those. And, and so I think I want to step away from the strategy of the dental practice for a moment, and I want to get into the psychology of how every one of us is feeling as business owners and operators and leaders and, and jump into a conversation of what, what has worked for some of you to combat the darkness that you might be facing right now and, and what's not working for you that maybe we can tell people to stay away from if somebody wants to jump in and field that question. Maybe I can even offer, if I may, Dr. Wilder and Tanya, we had some conversations early on in this area that you all were given tools, used the tools, and had results. Would you be willing to share that, if you remember, from last week? <laughs> sure. <laughs> no problem, Mark. You know, the uh, there, are, there are a number of things. I mean, uh, I, I will say quick, easy, is, is take is take 10 deep breaths. It does actually work. Uh, you know, when you're starting to feel the strain, 
just just stop uh, and regroup because it really will make a difference. Um, focus on the things that that you are happy about that you do have that are positive in your life, uh, your family, um, your your health. You don't have coronavirus. Um, you know that there are things to celebrate and and it is easy. Um, I, I will say that I will say that actually this morning. Uh, I woke up in a pretty dark place, um, uh, just feeling stress and pressure and um, working through that, actually sitting here listening to this and participating in this is helping. Um, but I will tell you that from my perspective, go out and do the things that, that you enjoy, the things that will take your mind off of what it is that you're struggling with. And I'm going to chime in as well because um, both of us run the our leaders and having my husband home at this particular dark time in our lives is actually a blessing. We're looking at these, uh, this time as reconnecting with the family and spending time with our children. We have one child and doing things that we don't have time to do projects. We, we live on five acres. So being able to go outside and, and look around and go, wow, I really wanted to do this project. And, and having conversations, spending time together, it's been a blessing. And we look at that as, you know, the light in this dark right now. Absolutely. What, uh, what techniques have you used when you're in that dark moment? Because it's easy to sit here when we're in a good moment, we're on video, and we're all face to face, and everybody looks 10 foot tall and bulletproof right now. But when you're struggling with that, and I know you mentioned at least one technique, but could you... What others do you have in your pocket? Because one of the bits of advice I love to give people is I want you to have a recipe of options available to you because in that dark moment, this first one on the list might not work for you. The second one on the list might not work for you. But if you have a recipe you can choose from, it gives you the ability to hit something else and maybe one of the other ones works for somebody else. Yeah, well, I agree with that. You do have to have because there are times when, when you know maybe your go-to just isn't enough. Um, you just have to, you just have to look at the things that you do, the things that you enjoy in your life. I'm mean, for me, music is, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, a rabid music fan and, uh, I'll find that sometimes I have to, uh, I just have to pick a, a playlist and listen to that. Um, get up, go outside, walk around I mean, it's snowing here, um, just a few minutes ago. So. Um, not necessarily a great time to go walking around, but maybe it is looking out the window and just recognizing the fact that it's a beautiful day. Um, I have, you know, one of the things that, that I've been doing is taking up archery with my daughter. Uh, and so, uh, we're having, we're having a good time doing that and just refocusing. Yeah, she's right. And just refocusing on the connection that I have with my child, who I don't get to see really all that often, uh, because she's in school and I'm at work, and you know, so um, being able to spend all this time with her has been has been great. But the the, the coping mechanisms that an individual are going to use are going to be specific to those people, I think. But you know, Darren, you've always taught, you know, if you're if you're in a bad place, stand up, change your position and your posture because it'll have a different impact. The first time we spoke was uh, was over a video like this, and you asked me to stand up because I wasn't I wasn't all that receptive at, at the beginning, and it really did change my mindset. So um, if anybody else has something, you know, that they do that makes them feel better when when they're feeling down, they should share that. So one of the things that we're, we teach a lot, and, and this is uh, Tony Robbins' content, so I can't take credit for it, but Tony teaches the triad of how you can do of state management, and the triad is a change in physiology, a change in focus, and, and a change in language. And what you're hearing uh, be addressed here by, um, by various people, quite frankly, is how do we can use those techniques to shift how we feel, what we think, and how we function. So one of the simplest things that you can do that Dr. Wilder was just talking about is when you're not feeling it is to get up and move. 
And, you know, it was a really interesting conversation that he alluded to because I just met him. I didn't know him at all. He didn't know me at all. And all of a sudden we're on this video and he looks super disconnected, um, even almost depressed, quite frankly. And I'm like, hey, do me a favor, stand up. And I'm sure he's thinking to himself, who in the world is this lunatic right here? And he stands up and then you see his entire demeanor sort of shift and change. So change in physiology can do so much for you. So if you're feeling bummed, you're feeling down, you know, maybe going for runs not the right answer for you because you're not a runner to start with and you already hate running, but maybe going for a walk, maybe just standing up, maybe just shifting any sort of physiology. And then you also heard them talk about a, a change in focus. You know, it's awesome to hear them talking about, hey, we, you know, we're usually so focused and stressed out about this, but now all of a sudden we're turning our focus to our daughter and spending time with her, precious time with her that we don't get otherwise at when she's at an age that is so impressionable where we get to be close to her and connect to her and do something completely different yeah. than we ever would otherwise. And so I, I find these to be super, super helpful tools. And Dr. Brown, thanks for popping in. I'm glad it worked. Um, you know, share with us what are some of the techniques, because you're somebody, if I can say it this way, who's done a lot of self-improvement and has probably the biggest tool bag of things that you can use at your disposal in an effort to um, shift your, your psychology in that moment. Share with us some of the techniques that you have found that work really well. Um, I think one of the things that really helps um, is to reach out to somebody um, in these times when we can feel isolated, um, but we can also feel um, overwhelmed and saturated with information, just reaching out via text message or a phone call um, has really helped. Um, and oftentimes I find the person that I have chosen to reach out to also really needs to, to hear from somebody. Um, even if it's just a quick, how are you? How are you doing? Um, what's going on? It just, it, it helps to, um, helps to remind us that we're not alone, even though we're sort of physically alone. Um, I've also do, been doing a lot of sewing, which is something I can do. And being creative, um, being creative. My kids have been drawing, we've been pulling all the craft projects out. Um, and, and so those have been things that, as I speak of my kids, here they are. Um, <laughs> all the things that we love to do in my never ending craft project, uh, craft room, we're, we're pulling all the supplies out. And like you said, it's getting to use um, this time, not so much as a quarantine, but almost a sabbatical um, of time to, to do the things that I've wanted to do, but just haven't had the time to do. I love it. I love it. Can you talk about your history of how some of these things in the past have positively impacted you? Maybe not necessarily right here, right now, but how have some of these techniques allowed you to escape some of the stresses and strains of life in your past? Um, let's see. Well, um, I mean, I definitely feel like the reaching out to other people when I sort of get stuck in my own head. Um, if I get too critical of something that's going on, whether in the office or at home or being my, by myself as a single mom, um, I, I find that it's just always, always. I'm going to jump in there, Darren, if I can. I love it. Brett Wilson here, everyone. Thanks for uh, having me on the call. I, I second, uh, Dr. Miller, I love your attitude, by the way, talking about opportunity, um, talking about humans and sewing physically, but sewing into, uh, into people, uh, speaking life into, into people. Um, these are this time as a faith builder, uh, really. You know, I, that's uh, that's where you are in an area where you need it in your life. Now is the time. I mean, just to pour into yourself. What can you read? What can you listen to? How do you how, how do you view the words like coming out of your mouth? Like, do you hear what's coming out of you know your mouth? And the words are so powerful of what we speak. There's a great book called Atomic Habits, and it's talking about the things that you know that you may view that you're not now, but you very well could be if you just changed your language a bit. I was never a runner. I am now. I never thought I would run at 38 degrees outside. That's the best time to run in snow. I mean, it's unbelievable how you just change the mindset and change the language coming out of your mouth, like what that does. I was never a cyclist. I am now. 
right? I mean, I'm disappointed they shut down the Iron Man. I, got, I was never thought that would be something I would ever do in my life, but it just took a step. It just took changing my language, saying it's we're going to do something different. So hopefully you just speak that into your team and hold those conference calls like this over Zoom. That's a great resource with your team. Pour into them. Talk to them. And use it time to train them on so many things I know you know you could do in your dental practice. Now's the time to do it. Now's the time to fine tune and really hone in on those skills that you need to come back. Like Dr. Miller was saying, better than ever. We're doing that on the manufacturing side, holding conference calls with our team. There's so many areas where we need to improve, get better, train our team. We're holding them constantly and just speaking life into people. We're the leaders. It's up to us for, to pour into other people. Um, don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I'm human too. I had a couple of dark moments. I had a friend reach out to me last night. I said, you know what? It's been a, it's been a lot of pressure today. Thank you for doing that. I needed that. So and Dr. Braun mentioned reaching out to someone. That's perfect. Reach out to them and just let them know you're thinking about them. You don't even have to have all the answers. You can just let them know you were thinking about them. So just a few thoughts there to hopefully help. You know, I, I, I love the uh, pouring life or speaking life into people that – there are so many people that are struggling, and, and for anyone who's watching here, you know, I, I want to be clear that not all of us have that sort of fortitude. Some of us will have more weak moments than others. Some of us will have longer weak moments than others, and, and the key is to be willing to admit, hey, you know, I need to tag out. One of the things I'm always teaching my team is every now and then we get in circumstances that are pretty challenging. And I'm always coaching my team that you've got to have the humility to tag out and ask for help. And I think it's important right here, right now, especially for those of us that are leaders, because this leadership role is, is it's a lonely road at the top at times, because you're supposed to have all the answers. You're supposed to have all the confidence. And yet all of us struggle with that at times. And any of us who sit here saying we don't, we're liars. And so having that resource network of people that we can call and reach out to and offer to and speak life into or call someone and go, hey, Brett, I need you to pour some life into me right now because I'm running on empty, dude. And, and you know what? What's interesting is when you ask for help from somebody, now all of a sudden, Brett, even if he was in a dark spot, I'm calling him because I'm, I'm in a dark spot and I'm asking him for help. I bet his energy increases because he might think that my dark spot's worse than his. And all of a sudden, he's going to be pouring life into me, which is going to feed him at the same time. So I think if we can get good at reaching out to people when we need it, these things will do wonderful, wonderful things for us to help us stay afloat emotionally, personally, mentally, and we'll do wonders around that. And, you know, JT, you'd be a great guy to weigh in right now because, you know, I, I think about when, when I met you, and I'll, I'll monologue for a second while you unmute. I think about when I met you, I wouldn't say you were in a dark place necessarily, but stress and anxiety was pretty high. And now, even in the face of all of this, I talked to you, I think it was last week, or maybe it was this week, I forget anymore now. And, and your answer was, dude, I couldn't be any better which sounds nuts, but here you are because of gratitude. And, you know, I think it's interesting. Mia posted a comment in the, in the thread here of, hey, what are five things you're, you have to feel grateful for? And it seems like a perfect segue to you, JT, to, to share kind of your story of, of how in this time you actually feel pretty good. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, with, with, with all the disaster that's going on, um, I've got a lot. I've got so much to be thankful for in my in my, in my life. Um, my wife and I just found out that she's pregnant. Uh, we've been trying for a long time. Um, we're actually in the process of moving, uh, which is it's this has given me time to actually kind of get organized and um, get get some of the stuff done that I, I did not know how I would have time to do that. Um, as far as managing the stress, really a lot of the stress has been over the last year and a, and a half, just feeling like trying to get my team to a place where. They had confidence in me and in the system. And, you know, with this disaster happening, um, they're actually all reaching out to me and saying they can't wait to get back to work and get moving on what we need to, to happen. So, you know, I have a lot, uh, so much to be thankful. I've got a good team behind me. Um, we're coming up with ideas to fill the schedule, um, get, to get back to work and get moving. Uh, I'm thankful that I saved the way that I did uh, before this happened. 
And that was a, something I prioritized uh, heavily in the beginning. Um, so, you know, I, I, knowing that everybody's going through this together gives me some comfort as well. I mean, it's not, I, I would feel much, I would feel a lot worse if it was just a localized thing, if it was um, uh, just me as a single dentist going through this. I mean, we've got a big community. We've got a lot of help. We've got a lot of support. Um, it, and I think that our patients are going to come through. I mean, really what I'm seeing from people more than anything is, is wanting to reach out and help each other right now. And they know that we're small businesses. We're in the communities, um, in the communities that we are, and certainly in the, in the area that I'm in, uh, people really want to support right now their local businesses. I feel like we're going to bounce back from this. It's going to take some hard work and some time, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm more positive now than I've been in the last, honestly, about a year and a half. So that's just mind blowing to me and awesome to hear. And I, I'm glad that you're one, you're a part of this and I'm a part of your life and your story relative to that, because it's humbling to hear that in the face of, uh, uh, you know, the first pandemic in a hundred years, you're the most optimistic and feeling the best you felt. And it's not like you're sitting on some great big, huge retirement and you're 85 years old. You know, you're a young guy on the front end of this stuff and trying to build toward it. And, and I think that's awesome and amazing. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with all the comments that are coming here. So, you know, if any of you are sitting there seeing comments that I might not be sitting, you email them to me. It's easier for me to see. But I see one that was posted here by Shane. I don't want to butcher Shane's last name, which is these are great. However, dental offices are going to be closed for several months. The financial concerns are real. People will lose hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and you know, I cannot deny the reality of this statement that, that Shane is making. And I apologize, Shane, if you're a doctor and I don't know it. Um, it's real. It's absolutely real. And, and my thoughts there are, first and foremost, are what can we do so we're alive on the other side of this thing so we have the ability to earn that money back? If we can't prioritize, and you know, I think of JT. He and I have had a whole bunch of conversation. Is he, He's a, a reservist as well, and he's the incident commander whenever things go sideways. In fact, he's probably activated doing that now. And one of the conversations he and I had just a few weeks ago was, when you come in as an incident commander, your job is to assess. And you, you know, in some cases, you're putting a black tag on someone, which means they're dead already. In some cases, you're putting a red tag on somebody. And, Apologize if I'm screwing up the colors, but you're putting a red tag on them, meaning you know you're going to die, you're still alive, but I cannot save you here right now. And then there's green tags where you're fine, quit your whine and walk away. And then there's a yellow tag where I think you can work or you can move, but you're injured. It's been a long time since I've gone through the incident command training, but the point is, is there is going to be some loss of business that's going to take place. In fact, I think probably more businesses might die than people. And I'm not trying to trivialize either side of this. And what we can do about that is everything we can to prevent it. But is there going to be loss, you know, to your point, loss of hundreds of thousands of dollars? Maybe. Perhaps. I don't know. It all depends on the circumstance. And, you know, part of what we want to provide here is a roadmap to help prevent that. But first and foremost, if our psychology is not in a good place to where we're creative, we don't have a chance at solving those problems. And, and going all the way back to Carl at the beginning, that was the whole point I'm trying to make to you, Carl, is not that your, your concerns aren't real or valid, because they absolutely are. But we've got to get ourselves out of the state of fear before we can address any of this sort of stuff because we won't have the creativity to do it. So my focus on these calls is going to be first around state management. How can we shift blood flow in the brain? Because without that, we will not be able to solve problems, at least not effectively. Uh, and I'd like to bounce in, Brett, on something, a couple things that you said that were just extraordinary to my ears were you personally focused, you read this book and then you focused on your own words and you realize your own words needed to be changed. And once you change your own words, you change your thoughts. And once you change your thoughts, you change your actions. If I could share that with our entire group that's listening to us right now, can we use this time as Brett is in his business, as he he's self-reflecting on, hey, you know, I have time. I haven't done that great. How can I change it? I hadn't done that great. I've always wanted to do this. So with your teams, can I ask you as a coach, could you ponder that? 
can you use this time to say, hey, this part of my business, it doesn't matter what part, has never been the way I wanted it. And you know, typically there's many, many, many solutions to any challenge. It's not one right answer. So in this area, how could I improve it? Perhaps something to write down. In this area, it's weak. Dr. Miller said you'd like to maybe, I don't know how you said it, something with your hygiene team. Hit the reset button because maybe the hygiene team is or isn't the, the place where you want it to be. So can we take this time and, and reflect, if you would, in the ways that Brett had mentioned, notice the words we're using, and then combine that with what Darren said, how can we change the state of how we're thinking so we can move forwardly positively during this time that we have a lot of time? Because we all know once this time ends, we're gonna be full speed ahead and then some. And how much have you planned? How proactive have you been? You know, let me put some mechanics behind this for everybody. And, you know, where this comes from is, uh, again, it's a Robbins concept that I'm, I'm plagiarizing right now, so full disclosure. But I like how he does it, and, and it's just, it's practical. And what he calls it is a mood meter, so I'm not going to try and call it something different to be cute. A mood meter, meaning 1 to 100, 100 being your best day of your life, 1 being the worst day of your life, what score would you give yourself right here, right now? What's your number? No judgment on the number, but what is your number? Is it a 25? Is it a 50? Is it a 60? Whatever it is, assess and put a metric behind it. Then the question becomes, what could I do? Let's assume 35 is your number today. What could I do to go from a 35 to a 40? Going from a 35 to a 70, way too big of a jump. But what could I do right now? And I did this once live with a group of people. Um, and I was hoping they would join us today, but I don't see them on here. But I did this, and some girl shared, and I forget what her number was, let's assume it's a 35 for the sake of illustration. But she, she says, well, you know, what I could do, and this is in front of a pretty good-sized room of people. She goes, well, I could give, I could give my, one of my friends a hug. I said, well, fabulous, give your friend a hug. And so she got up in front of everybody in this room, and, and then she didn't just give one person a hug, because apparently she was loving it. She went and hugged her entire team which I didn't expect, and all of a sudden I'm sitting there going, okay, how do I manage this from a, a presentation perspective? So I spoke over the top of her about the impact and the neurology of this as she went around and hugged her entire team of like 15 employees, and then she came back and I said, so how do you feel now? And her number was like astronomically higher, and I'm like, well, I didn't expect it to be that big. And she's like, no, it is. I feel amazing right now compared to where I was just a few minutes ago. I'm like, well, that's something you should note, because apparently for you, physical touch and hugging the people that are most important to you is really profoundly impactful on your well-being. That might be the thing you want to put at the top of your list. Now, for some of you guys, you might not be the huggy sorts, and that's okay. But what can you do right now if you were to write down a score? So for everyone of you watching right now, do me a favor, put in the comments below, what's your number? 1 to 100, 100 best day, 1 the worst day, what's your number? And then I want you to follow in the comments of the live feed. What could you do right now that would help you go up five points, ten points? What's that? And the reason why I'm asking you to put it in the comments here is not to be a shameless promoter. It's because there's going to be a million ideas in the comments on Facebook, Molly. The, <laughs> there's going to be a million ideas that everybody can read through and use that works for them on how to feel better. And so do me a favor, post what is it that works for you? I'll tell you mine. I have a couple. One, I love hugging my kids and my wife. I don't know which order. I, don't anyone tell my wife that. But I love hugging my kids. I love hugging my wife. And one of the other things I love to do is go out and be in the barn. I love being out in my barn, scooping poop, playing with horses. Just brings so much goodness to my heart and soul that it's amazing. So what is it that works for you? And what is it that helps you get past it? Just five points. Don't try and go 20. Don't try and go 30. What would help you go up five points? And for any of you guys here listening or uh, speaking on my panel, jump in and share, if you haven't already, what is it that would work for you with somebody else that somebody else could see in here? Can I jump in for a second there? Love it. Okay. So um, just back up a little bit um you know everybody was talking about strategies that they use to to feel better and things and, and i'll admit like when i got home i was expecting the email to come sometime next last monday and it did and um i checked my email on the way home when i got home i couldn't even 
talk. Like I saw my wife and um, she knew something was wrong. I couldn't even talk. I just started crying and uh, handed her my phone. She read the email um, and then you know, and talked about it for a little bit. But for me, to be honest, I needed a few days just to kind of absorb it all and think about it and, and what I was going to do. Um, but then it was strategy of how am I going to get better? So a lot of people have talked about a lot of these things already, whether it be religion or family or working out. But one thing that really worked for me, um, back to the whole reset thing, you know, is Dennis and most of us are probably business owners as well. We really have two full-time jobs. And for me, things that was really starting to cause a lot of stress in my life was the business side of it. Um, at the beginning of the year, I bit off a lot of projects, um, you know, clear aligners, new website, um, training with AMP, um, SEREC, we're adding that to the office now. It just felt really overwhelming um, to the point that I was considering taking a few days off, um, not for vacation, but just to get caught up on the business side. So for me, I do look at this as kind of a blessing. Obviously, none of us want to be closed for three weeks, a month, six weeks, anything like that. But, you know, I initially I was really overwhelmed because I felt a lot of the burden of it was on my shoulders. You know, I had a staff that needed to be paid I had myself that needed to be paid. I had, um, all of my, the, the banks, the, the suppliers, the labs that still needed to be paid. And one of the first things I did was I got on the phone with all of them and my lender was really good to work with. My lab was really good to work with. My landlord was good to work with. My supplier has been really good to work with. So instantly I started to feel a big relief from where, from there. But to get back to your point of what are we doing now um, to help with these things, I like to use lists. Um, without a list to do for the day, I get very distracted and kind of, you know, here and there on everything. And at the end of the day, I look at it and go, well, what did I do today? I know I did. I worked all day long. What did I do? I, I don't know. So with a list, it's really good for me just to, to start either the morning with what I didn't get done the day before or to sit real quick and, and jot down three or four things that I need to get done. And that's where I'm at. So for me, it kind of sounds sick coming to work has kind of been therapy. I mean, I'm in scrubs right now. I'm just doing my part to keep people out of the emergency rooms. Um, saw a patient for an extraction yesterday, no big deal. I'm not doing dentistry the way I want to be doing it. But it is a time to really focus on the business side of things and, again, try to reset and grow and, and make the best of it that I can because none of us can control the situation. You know, when we go back to work and things like that, it's, it's all out of our control. So just use the time the best you can so that when we are getting the green light again, we're ready to go, and um, it's going to be positive. You know, I want to summarize what you said in a different way because I love it, and I think it might resonate with some others. How can you break down the insurmountable list of things, the stuff, into bite-sized pieces? How can you take whatever is huge and, and make a little chunk and a little chunk and a little chunk that you can knock out? Because as, as Dr. Miller just illustrated, when you start to make progress, you start to feel better. If you're going backwards, we feel terrible. But when we're going forward and we're making progress or we're growing, even if it's baby steps, we feel better. And, you know, my illustration I always use with that is when my wife and I went through some marital challenges a number of years ago. I mean, there was a while there where I... I mean, I think she wanted to kill me, and she certainly wasn't happy with me. And then all of a sudden, you fast forward some period of time, and, and she, like, held my hand. And I was like, oh, she's holding my hand. I'm so excited she's holding my hand. And I, you would have thought I was like a 14-year-old boy with his first girlfriend and holding his hand because it was progress. The regression was painful, but the progress was gave me hope and optimism. The regression we're going through right now is absolutely painful. But the progress of being able to break down some small barrier, some small chunk, some small piece, as Dr. Miller just illustrated, can give you some hope and the ability to feel momentum building and going the right direction. So take whatever lists you've got, and I think lists are awesome. I'm seeing comments here of lists. I see Bryce Larson put that in here. You know, lists are awesome. Break them down into small things, really, really small, because you're going to feel progress when you can check something off. And I think it will allow you to feel better about momentum and progress. Anyone else want to comment on that? No, Anne, are you still there? Yep. And Dr. Braun's there, which are two of the same team. Um, if I could switch a little bit 
combining strategies and business planning perspective. If it's okay with you, Anne, I'll set the stage for you so you won't have to say too much. But um, Anne is a client of ours in Louisville, Kentucky, and she's got a front desk team, particularly one gal that what I call a ninja. This gal has really stepped up her performance. A lot of it was based on a bonus structure that was given to the whole front team. She took it and ran, and here's how I describe her. Don't get in her way the last week of the month because her bonus is based on collections, and she, if you have to interrupt her while she's asking a patient for money, she will interrupt you and say, excuse me, I'm, I'm busy. So, Anne, could you share with the team that's here how that worked and how that really changed Lori in, in her perspective? And in addition to maybe Anne could give us all some feedback on how we can plan when we're resetting our reset button. Here's an idea. Well, Barb had encouraged me to make, to, to offer a bonus system to my non-producers because the producers all get paid based on what they collect or produce. And my front desk team just got their hourly and my assistants just got their hourly. So um, I, I was afraid to do it because I was afraid I wouldn't have the money to do it. And I always think it has to be something really big. Um, I did, I had minimized the appreciation for a hundred dollars or $150. And, and the team really loved that. So um, what we did, we put in place where when collections were, I'm, I'm just going to say $50,000, every person, all my non-producers got a $100 bill. And when it went up $5,000, they got a $50, an additional $50 bill until it was just graduated like that. So it wasn't a lot of money. Um, but it was enough money that by golly, they wanted to make that base number every month. And since we started doing it, um, and truly our base number was sort of, I won't say it was a, a big reach, but it was a reach and we've made it every single month except for one. And it, it really made the team invested in how were we doing on collections? Because collections, I mean, from a, the business side, I mean, that's what makes or breaks us. And my team got real concerned about how much money we were collecting and made that a, a priority and uh, really made it worth their while to be sure that patients don't get out the door without um, paying their bill and then following up with people, putting people on payment plans. I mean, she became very creative, um, my, well, Lori, and she became very creative in how to just make everything run. And she really does have a gift. Um, but when we put that carrot out there for, for my front desk team, for my non-producers, um, they became very concerned about collections. And, and my producers became very concerned about making sure my non-producers made that bonus. I mean, so it was a whole team spirit and it, it has really impacted our office. And again, it didn't have to be a lot of money. I thought, Oh my gosh, I have to, you know, I have to say it's going to be $500 for each person. Absolutely not. I mean, if we make this base threshold, everybody gets a hundred dollars and they were thrilled and they continue to be thrilled. And in fact, the month that they said that, that we did not make it, I had somebody came up and say, are you going to tell us that you're going to give us the bonus money anyway? <laughs> I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but we, we've enjoyed doing that and it really does make everybody a team and everybody feels rewarded when the office does well. So, is, there, is that where you were going? Yes. Uh -huh. Thank you, Ann. And, I, you know, with my coaching hat on, I just want to share with everybody prior to that conversation, and if your coach hasn't done this with you yet, they will. We had a very clear understanding team-wide how much money it costs to run that business, not with doctor salaries, but just break-even costs, overhead costs, profitability, um, uh, incremental growth, and the team 
after that meeting, the team really had a better understanding because right after that meeting, they were introduced to their bonus and they got a bonus that day. So they went from conceptual understanding to money in their hand and it happened to work for them. Just an idea for you, a piece of strategy to think about. Thank you, Ann. Barb, how can we use that sort of a strategy right now during downtime? What are your thoughts? Meet with your team. Meet with your team and tell them your plan. You know, as you all know that the teams whom I coach, you hear me say this quite often, tell them the truth. Be vulnerable and tell them the truth. There's power in vulnerability. I don't mean be vulnerable and be a wimp, not that any of you would be. But if you are truly honest with your team, Dr. Carl, meet with your team and say, hey, you know, I have these concerns. I'd like to hit the reset button, but I have a couple of fears that we're going to have such downtime that we're going to be sparse in September. Can you guys help me with that concept? Come up with some strategies with me together. Let's use this team time today to come up with some strategies so we can, in turn, use those strategies the next time we talk. And all of a sudden, your team will have a different engagement and a different reason to meet again. It's the same concepts we teach. Give a strategy, allow empowerment. What are the results? I think your minds will be blown, the talent on your team. And the drive and the commitment. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a time I was watching um, Joshua Scott do a presentation yesterday, I think it was. Uh, Joshua Scott's a guy I met in Florida, good guy, great speaker, marketing company. And he was interviewing someone else. I didn't know the guy. He was a CEO of a company. So I apologize if either of you are watching this right now. Um, and, and they were asking, the question or the conversation became one of, how is your team showing up? And it was really interesting to listen to what they had to say because they were saying that they had some people they laid off and they had some people that they laid off that were still like, hey, can, can we still work? <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't want to just sit at home. I'd rather have a purpose to my life right now. And so they had to design an internship for them to be able to work while they weren't able to compensate them because they were on unemployment, and which I thought was really creative. But I thought it was also really awesome to see these people. They're like, hey, you know what? I get them on unemployment, but I want to sit around. I want to do something. I need a purpose in my life. And then there were others that were like, hey, you know, my finances are good. I'm fine. I would rather you pass them on to somebody else down here who needs them. And to hear that story go on was just uplifting. And it, I don't know, it was amazing to me to hear. Because, you know, there's so many people in this world that don't think like that, sadly, that are all in it for themselves. And I get it. The challenge is, though, this is why if you're a, if you're a lifeguard, they teach you don't get too close to a drowning victim because the drowning victim will kill you, too. And we've got to be careful in our positions right now that we are, are here to be able to help but not get drowned by the person we're trying to help. And any one of us can be the lifeguard. Any one of us can participate in our own rescue. I heard another speaker once that was using this metaphor. She was a lifeguard apparently and there was some tragedy where some boats got turned over. Lauren is her name, Lauren Laha, anyone I'm not going to butcher her last name. And there was some tragedy where uh, some boat got turned over and she was swimming up to try and help people and, and she had to stop and think to herself, hey, I've got to find, identify the people who are willing to participate in their own rescues. Because if I go to this person over here who's flailing around, they're going to kill me. If I go to this one over here, they're going to kill me. But there's these three in the middle who are relatively calm, who are doing the best they can, who I can save these people. And I think we all need to think like that ourselves. And the first question we need to do is look in the mirror and go, am I somebody who's participating in my own rescue right now? Or am I somebody who's shutting down those who are reaching out trying to help me? Am I somebody who's bashing those who might be willing to help me? How much am I participating in my own rescue right here, right now, when I need the rescuing? And, and I think whether we're the leaders in the offices, whether we're the team members in the offices, I think looking in the mirror and asking ourselves that question, powerful question to ask yourself. How willing am I to participate in my own rescue? Because if I'm not willing to participate in my own rescue, why in the world would anyone else be willing to participate in rescuing me? And, and I think it's a tough question to ask, and it's not an easy one to have to face, but I think it's a real one. And I think it's the difference between those that get pulled out of the water, the drowning victims that get pulled out of the water and those that don't. 
And, you know, there's a lot of you guys, you know, relative to, I heard a comment here, I'm trying to keep up with the comments, but I saw a comment of, you know, the, the production or, or the, the money lost. And, you know, some of the opportunity cost that we're going to lose, we can't do anything about it. I mean, lost opportunity is lost opportunity. We can try and recover it through time, through having people back in, through efficiency, through cranking out production later. And in the meantime, perhaps the answer is some of the SBA's um, offerings they're putting out there. And I know the law just got passed last night at midnight. I have not had time to read it as I was putting this together. But I'm hearing, and take this all with a grain of salt because I have not fact-checked it, I'm hearing that there's ability to apply. First off, there's the ability to apply, apply for disaster relief lending. And I covered all of that about a week ago on a different Facebook Live. So if you're just joining us and you're, you're not familiar with who we are, I've done a whole bunch of content. You know, About every two, three days, we're doing some sort of a Facebook Live. Here we're putting together a panel of people. And... One of the things I said in one of the previous Facebook Lives is that there are some, hey, look at that. Oh, it's a different one. Um, there, uh, there are some SBA options for disaster relief funding. The typical loans are at 3.75%. And I hear through the new stimulus that there is potentially some loans that if you follow some guidelines, perhaps the, the loan is forgiven and doesn't have to be repaid. Um, I've heard that multiple times from multiple sources, but I haven't fact-checked it myself. So if anyone has any additional thoughts on that they can share, I'd love to hear it if they know more about it than I do. But, you know, there are things like that that will take some work and effort. But, you know, there's not a bank that's just going to roll up with a big old truck full of cash in your garage and drop it off and say, here you go. And I realize I'm talking silly because everybody understands this. But yet one of the things I love to do as an illustration of this very point whenever I lecture is I'll stand up with a $20 bill or a $50 bill or whatever it might be saying, hey, who wants this? And it's interesting because people raise their hands. And, and then I repeat it again, deadpan face, and say, who wants this? And more people raise their hands. And then I just keep repeating it until somebody gets off their keister, walks up, and takes the money out of my hand because that's what it's standing there for. And I'm trying to make a point of sometimes you've got to get up and take action in order to help yourself. And while we might be feeling blue and having a hard time, we have to take action ourselves. If you can't reach out to somebody else to take you along with them, to, to come alongside you, to breathe some life into you, to help you out, but the reality still is at some point we're going to have to walk on our own. We're going to have to show up to work. We're going to have to apply for a job. We're going to have to apply for an SBA loan. We're going to have to call the bank that we're doing our banking with, like Dr. Miller said, and ask them for some leeway. And most every bank, I mean, the one he was referencing, I don't remember if he said it was Bank of America. And, you know, a lot of the banks have built leeway into their plans around their contingency and response plans to all that's going on. They're not going to be surprised by this phone call. So I think it's interesting to, to use the resources that are around us, but you got to take the step. So I think what happens a lot of times is people get all this noise in their heads and they think of 10 bazillion things that they need to do or improve on. And really what they could do is list those things out, but pick one thing. Like, what is the one thing I could do today? And I liked your post, uh, I think it was two or three days ago, on the gratitude exercise. You know, either start your day with a gratitude exercise or finish your day with a gratitude exercise is huge. And I had put down in the comments, too, that our company, Sleep Group Solutions, is having a free webinar tonight on how to be a leader during this time of crisis. Because I'm hearing a lot of people are, you know, some of us are strong leaders. Some of us have ideas on what to do. Other of us don't really have a clue. Uh, so I would extend that invitation. It's completely free. It's non-solicitation. And uh, if you're not bombarded enough with all the online content that's coming at you, because none of us can go anywhere and do seminars that we're used to giving every week, um, I'd, I hope you could join me for that. So thanks for the invite, Darren. It's good to see you as always. And I'm watching it snow out the window right now. So It's sunny down here to the south of you and uh, beautiful and warm. So I'm not getting any sun here. I wanted to share with everybody that the Wilders that are with us, Dr. Wilder and Tanya that spoke earlier, they start their, they start their day, they end their huddle, and everyone has to share a piece of gratitude. I think I said this to you, the Dr. Wilder and Tanya, if I haven't, I'll say it again. It was one of the most powerful things I've witnessed at a huddle because it was heartfelt, it was off the cuff, and everybody had a place. Please continue to do that. It's a beautiful uh, thing. Barb, thanks. I, 
if I could chime in on that. I, I, I do believe that it's important for everybody to start off their day finding something to be great. There's, we all have something to be grateful for. Um, but it changes your mindset when you walk in and you have that, that attitude of gratitude. Uh, so we will, con- we will continue to do that. Uh, and I would, I would strongly encourage everybody to do that. It actually makes a huge difference in morale. Awesome. You know, I, I think uh, we're probably headed to a point where we can start to wrap this up. There was one other person I was really, really hoping to get on here, and it looks like it's not going to work out. He texted me. And, and so I'm going to have to summarize his story and maybe bring it on at a later date and time. I think one of the reasons why a lot of people are stressed out and very, very fearful about everything going on is they're worried about bankruptcy. They're worried about the financial disaster that could come out of this, and, and rightfully so. The other doctor that I was hoping would join us, Dr. Greg, and we'll have, like I said, I'll have him on a different time, went through bankruptcy. And ironically, will tell you and will share with you at a different date and time that he is better off now than he, he ever was before. He'll share with you that the process sucked. It was challenging. He didn't enjoy it about five, six years ago. But he's in a better place now as a result of it. And, you know, probably my best metaphor I can tell of that, and it's a story I heard from somebody else, but I'm going to tell the first person like it's mine, is, you know, my brother and I, when we were little, we're, we're out biking and we're driving our bikes as fast as we can and we crash and he gets this terrible road rash up and down his body. And so he gets dragged into the ER to, to get cleaned up, right? And he's got all this dirt and debris and gravel and rock and sand in his skin. And what do they do in the ER? They pull out a steel brush, and while rinsing it with water, they take a steel brush and they scrub his skin, tearing it further in an effort to cleanse what was going on. And he's screaming bloody murder. It's just god-awful to watch. And and he's screaming because it hurts so bad, but yet it's necessary to take place because the impending infection that follows, if you don't do this, potentially kills you or causes something, you know, loss of limb as an example. And sometimes, as as illustrated by Greg, if you were here to share his story, that process sucked. He won't say it was awesome. He'll tell you it sucked. But he'll tell you that while he went through it and it sucked, now he's in a better place where he's happier, he's healthier, he's lost a ton of weight because he's eating, he's taking care of himself. Because he's taking care of himself, he's able to function on a better level as a clinician than he ever was. It's interesting to see how when you get to the other side of it, it works out differently and better. So I I want all of you to understand that while I wish I had the answer for everything or or that this panel had the answer for everything, there's too many unknowns. There's no way we can. What we will do and what I'll commit to do is to repeat this again next week with a different group of people or maybe some of the same people. And if you've got questions or comments or concerns, please share them. Facebook message me. Put them in the comments here and we'll do some research because I know there was one question that was put out here that was, hey, how are offices handling people who are paid uh, based on production, whether hygiene or, or maybe associates? Independent contractors, that's pretty cut and dry. It's pretty easy. But for any W-2 employees who are paid on production, that's a great question that I don't know if I know the answer to. If someone does right now, feel free to jump in. But otherwise, I'll be back next week, probably the same time. We'll do something just like this. I'll bring some other group of people in, and I'll make sure I have an answer to that one. Um, and it, I like this prediction. It's really funny. And But we'll have answers for you, and we'll continue to do it. So do me a favor. Keep posting comments about what questions or concerns you've got so we can come back and we can answer them in subsequent uh live feeds and those of you who might be interested in joining us in a live feed hit me with a Facebook message or again in the comments here so I can invite you on and love to have you and and with that I'm gonna ask Brett Wilson to come back on and I'm gonna ask Brett Wilson to close this for us okay Darren asked uh, if I would close in prayer so Heavenly Father thank you so much for the individuals that are on this call those that are business leaders those maybe your employees we're all going through this together Father we just lean on you 
not on our own understanding, but on you and on what your word says. We speak your word and we, we know you, you have us, you have us in our best interests. We just pray, Father, we just bind in the name of Jesus, all evil forces that have come against us, against finances, against our businesses, perhaps even against our family, against those who have had this virus. We bind those and we lose favor, Father. We lose healing. We lose all good things that you've brought to us. We know you didn't cause this, but you know we know you have the pathway for us to get out of this. So we put our faith and our trust in you. We thank you for what you're providing in the healthcare. We pray for all those individuals that are out there in the healthcare business that are just working as hard as they can to uh, take care of individuals that are sick. Father, pray for our government and the decisions that they make. Um, and you just you're just with them. You're with them in their guidance. You're with them in their in their faith as they strengthen them. They just, again, lean on you. I just pray a blessing over everyone. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you, Brett. I want to thank all of uh, the panel who joined us. I mean, we've got Colorado, we've got Arkansas, we've got South Dakota, we've got Kentucky, we've got Washington, we've got Louisiana, we've got Indiana, uh, a decent cross-section of the country. And, you know, I, I like I said, I plan to repeat this next week. So if anyone's willing to join me again next week, we'll get those invites out. We'll broadcast at the same time as we did today. For any of you watching, f please feel free to share this. I got one question of, hey, how can someone watch this if they don't have Facebook? Uh, Deanna James sent that. Deanna, do me a favor. Send me a message with an email address. I will find a way to get it to you so you can share it with whoever you need to. Um, I, I thank everybody's expertise, their time, their attention, and, and their vulnerability to share what's going on. And all we can do is stay in this together. And, you know, I loved how Brett put it. I should have done all this before Brett went so we could have gone out on his high note, but I didn't think that through well enough. So thank you so much for everybody. And uh, everybody have a great day out there. Stay as healthy as you can. Wash your hands often. Stay six feet apart while you hug. And, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll keep plugging away as a, as a team to help bring dentistry through this whole process. So thank you so much, everybody. Have an awesome day.